Crowns before the Lamb of God and sin. 
Good morning. Good morning, Lord. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> he showed up. Benevolent God, you are the source, guide, and goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be revealed also with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But you must now get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, 
seeing that you, are stripped, you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, enslaved and free, but Christ is all and in all. Please stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Luke writes of Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And these things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Who else loves things that make noise? Me. All right. And what is this? That's a jigsaw puzzle. That's right. When I was a, a small boy, my grandmother gave me a bunch of jigsaw puzzles that she had done so many times she was tired of doing all of them. And... The first one I put together, I was really excited. You know, you start with the edge, you get the inside, you get it all taken care of, and I get done. There's one piece right from the middle that's missing. Um, I'm guessing she got tired of the jigsaw puzzle and just threw that piece away and then gave it to me and just thought that would be fun. I'm not sure. That's the way my family operates. But whenever you have a jigsaw puzzle that has a piece missing, it just feels wrong. Well, that's kind of the way our life is. We're like a big puzzle. And there's a piece missing that's shaped like God. And we try to put other things into that, and it just doesn't work, and it doesn't work. And so until we get God into that place and what he wants us to do, Kevin, stop talking, <laughs> then we're not going to quite feel right. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for giving us a heart-shaped, a God-shaped hole in our heart, and that you fill it with the Holy Spirit. We just pray that you'd be with us today and for always, that we do what you want. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, kids, go back to your parents. They're a fun group. They're immature, but they're fun. There's no question about it. 35 years ago, it's hard to believe it's been 35 years. You two came out with, with their debut album, Joshua Tree. And there was a song on that album that has just stood the test of time. Who, who knows what that song is? Any U2 fans here? Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh, yeah. 35 years. And that song is still played and sung all over the place today because the song and its message resonate with each one of us. We're all searching and striving to find that missing piece of the puzzle, to be all that God made us to be, to find what we're looking for. See if this sounds familiar. Have you ever bought new stuff to organize your old stuff so that you would have room to buy more new stuff? Have you ever brought home just a really good box because you knew at some point you were going to store something in it? You know, uh, container stores and storage businesses thrive on that kind of thinking. Have you ever been so envious or wishful for someone else's life that you were not able to celebrate her or his successes, abilities, or good fortune? You look at them and you think, why isn't that me? That's not fair. What about me? 
Has the grammar of your life ever been predominantly first person singular, I? I want, I need, I desire, I achieved, I accomplished, I plan, I, I, I. Have you ever bought something to make yourself feel better? Maybe you were sad, lonely, angry. And what you really wanted was a new life or a new feeling, but you went ahead and bought it anyway. If any of this sounds familiar, and even if it doesn't, but you can relate to it, then you probably full well understand what you 2 was singing when they said, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And you probably understand you haven't become all you can become in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that as a judgment or a criticism. I'm saying that as a recognition that I, and perhaps you, have something that we can learn from today's scriptures because both Paul and Jesus tell us how we can find what we're looking for. The first couple of verses in Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then you also will appear with him in glory. Timothy Hansel, the late Christian author and seminar leader, used to be very adamant that the true symbol of a Christian should be thumbs up. He said, first of all, it signifies that everything's going okay, but also it points the direction that we should be thinking. And I think that symbolism goes very well with the scriptures from today. Because twice in this passage, Paul tells us to set our hearts and our minds on things above. Now at first glance, it's hard to tell who are Christians in this world and who are not Christians in this world. We all look the same. We're just ordinary looking men, women, boys and girls. But according to scripture and an actual experience, being a Christian means we have an extra dimension to our life. There's a hidden resource, an invisible reality, which the world does not have and cannot see. Now, this is not referring to Christ being up in heaven or lost in space somewhere. Rather, this is what Paul refers to when he, in, earlier in this letter when he talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. The extra dimension is not far away. It's right within our hearts. An untouchable, invisible dimension lives right inside of us. And that's the glory of the Christian life, the secret of its power, joy, and courage. This is what puts a smile on our face even when we're going through hard times. Set your heart on things above is the first thing he says. Set your heart on this hidden resource is Paul's exhortation. He means our affections, the things that we care about that we first think with affectionate gratitude of what Jesus has already done for us and what he's doing for us now. It's not a form of escapism. It's not something you think about all day long to the exclusion of your family, your friends, and your business. On the contrary, Christ is part of every situation, and when you are involved with family, friends, and business, you bring him into it. This is what Paul means when he says, your life is hid with Christ and God. Jesus is involved with our activities. Remind yourself that whatever you are involved in, it includes the person of the Lord himself. His wisdom, his power, and his knowledge are available to you. And he closed all this in talk about baptism. Since you have been raised with Christ, since you have died, you have been put to death. And that's what baptism is. It's a putting to death of the old person and raising of the new person. And he's going to talk more about baptism a little bit later on. We'll save that for them. 
it's not only our affections that we are to set on this hidden resource, but he also says, set your minds on things above. Now, Paul's talking about our wills and our choices. Decide to do what you know from your study of the Bible that God wants you to do. You already know it. And that's the secret to a life that's really lived. Your life, your thoughts, your daily activity. Everything is tied to Christ. You belong, you belong to him. The old godless self-directed life is put to death. We follow Christ. And he also puts hope with us right there. That when Christ comes again, all that we've been hearing of how to share his life will become visibly manifest. There's a new day coming. God is already at work in each one of us making that day come about. Again, that's invisible to the world. But to sum up these verses, just very quickly, Paul is saying, remember who you are now. Remember who you used to be but are no longer and think about who you are going to be when Christ returns. But what happens when our priorities get mixed up? What happens when we don't set our hearts and minds on this hidden resource, set our hearts and minds on things above? When we forget that all good things come from God and we start thinking that all of our successes and all the things we have come from our talents alone and God has no hand in it. Well, let's look at the gospel for today. Now, first of all, in our gospel reading, it has left out the first section of this chapter. So just to know, Jesus is teaching about faithfulness under persecution. And then this guy who hasn't been listening at all interrupts him, completely off topic, demanding that he help arbitrate the situation of an inheritance between he and his brother. Now, from our 21st century viewpoint, this probably seems a little bit odd. But in first century Palestine, it was very usual for a rabbi to arbitrate uh, situations like this, and it was considered legally binding. So this request, if we can get past the guy's rudeness, is a fairly normal request, and he was probably surprised when Jesus declined. Now, please note that Jesus did not decline on the basis of his authority to be involved in it. He declined on the basis of the, the reason the man wanted him to get involved, because the law of Moses gave specifics about how inheritance was to be divided amongst children. This man wanted more than he was due. He was focused on stuff rather than seeking God. So Jesus responds to this man the same way he does any time up, someone comes up to him and asks him a question. He answers with a question. Who made me judge and arbitrator over you? He tells a parable following that that gets to the heart of the man's real problem, which is greed. Now greed only makes you poorer because you're focusing on everything you don't have instead of everything you do have. And God is all about abundance and generosity. So the parable, without any more labor than he would normally put forth, this farmer has a bumper crop. He could tell the harvest was going to be great, and again, to the Jewish mind, if you had something like that happen, that was an indication of God's blessing. Good fortune meant you had done something to please God, that you were a good guy, and God was smiling on you. Well, surprise number one. Jesus says this farmer is not a good guy, and as a matter of fact, he's a fool. And he goes on to punctuate this by having the gentleman talk to himself. In any stories from that era, the person in the story who talks to himself is almost universally the bad guy. But it gets worse. Listen to what the farmer says. I know, says the farmer. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones to store all my wealth. Then I can relax and eat, drink, and be merry. Now this just doesn't make any sense at all. You don't tear your barns down right before harvest. And why is he storing the grain? 
the grain is eventually going to rot, sour, and it won't be able to be eaten by anybody. And farmers raise crops in order to, to sell so other people can eat. Building bigger barns to hoard what you will never be able to use is just wasteful. So surprise number two. Surprise number one was the farmer was not a good guy when he was blessed by God. Surprise number two, God shows up. This is the only parable in the entire New Testament in which God is there as one of the actors. And Jesus delivers the line. You fool, God says, this very night your soul will be required of you. So now who's going to get all that wealth you accumulated? And surprise number three, instead of being an indicator of God's favor, the rich fool's attitude about wealth brings death to his door. Now, we're not talking about wealthy people. We're talking about attitudes about wealth. There are some very rich people who are focused not on money, but on giving money away and taking care of those less fortunate. There are some people who are very poor and some people who are middle class who think all the time about getting more money and getting wealth. It's the thinking about it. It's not that the love of money is the root of all evil, or it's not that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil in the scriptures. He was so wrapped up in what he had that he couldn't become what God had made him to be. And so we come to the last, back to the last few verses in Colossians. But now you must put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, Paul tells us to get rid of the old life. And the reason for doing this is that we belong to Christ, and he rem reminds us why we belong to Christ. It's because of our baptism. I just read those few verses. Did you hear anything about baptism in there? In the first century, they always practiced baptism by immersion, and it was related to the Jewish ceremonial washings, where they would lower you into the water, which represents the death and burial of Christ. They would raise you up out of the water, which represents the resurrection of Christ. But they did something more. Whenever someone was baptized, they would change clothes. They would take off the old dirty clothes and they would put on a white robe, signifying that they have taken off the old life and they have put on Christ. So when Paul says, you have taken off the old life and you have put on Christ, he's referring back to their baptism. And he's reminding them that they are being renewed in the knowledge of their creator. Whenever you have questions about your life, go back to your baptism. Whenever you have questions about the stuff you have, about how to deal with people, go back to your baptism. Recall your baptism and remember that you have set aside all anger, malice, slander, bad talk, and lying. And that you have put on Christ. When you wonder why you still haven't found what you're looking for, recall your baptism. Parents, if you wonder why Pastor David encourages you to light the baptismal candle every year on the anniversary of your child's baptism, it's to remind them and to remind you about their baptism and the hope that we all have in the fullness of the Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory that we have put on Christ. It's God's desire for each of us to grow into who he created us to be, to live in community, to love, to share the things that he has given to us and to display a desire for spiritual truth instead of all of the stuff we tend to gather around us. He wants us to show grace and mercy. And it's then that we become who we can be, and maybe, just maybe, then we'll find what we're looking for. Amen. Awesome.
now let's share the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all that you have done for us. We give you thanks for all that you are doing for us currently. And we give you thanks for the future, that you have loved us so much that you've placed your spirit within us, that you've called us to be more than just human, but to have that added dimension. We just pray that you would help us to use you as a resource as well as a loving father. We ask that you'd be with Pastor David and Diane as they are traveling back from vacation, that you would give them safe traveling mercies, and that you would be with those that we place on our hearts, Wayne, Richard, Marilyn, Miriam, Sally, Kim, Carol, Mike and Keith, David, Courtney, Stephanie, Clayton, Bob, Pam, Russell, Carol, and Braden, Margie, Kristen, and Dawn, Sheila, Martha, and Nick, Libby, Julie, and Nick, and Marcy. And Lord, we also pray for those we mentioned during this time of silence. Father, we ask that your mercy and grace be upon each of these situations. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his apostles. And he said, drink you all of it. For this is the blood of the New Testament. Surely as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember me until I come. Let's share the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Keep you in his strength now and forever. Amen.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Joy, my righteousness.